Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's Gama Sutra editorial forum called Intentional Leadership. It's a talk from game production expert Grant Schonkweiler and made possible by our sponsor, Tara Dici. I'm Chris Graft, editor in chief of Gama Sutra, and I'll be lurking around here as a moderator. So we just have a few announcements before we start. Uh, this form is designed to be interactive. Um, the dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webcast via social media, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. You can put questions in whenever you want. Um, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download a copy of the slides via the resources widget. Uh, we'll start with our featured speaker, uh, Grant, followed by a short message from our sponsor. And after that, a live Q&A with our speakers. So make sure to stick around until the end. Um, so we, um, like toward the end of the forum, we'll ask you to complete our survey. That's found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide us with valuable information. Uh, lastly, if you are experiencing any technical problems, please click the help widget found at the bottom of your screen, or type your issue into the Q&A area, and we'll be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. Now onto our featured session, Intentional Leadership. It's a talk by Grant Schonkweiler. Uh, he's founder of production consultancy, Schonk Ventures. Um, he's actually in the middle of launching a game right now during the presentation. So he's, a, he's a programmer, lead designer, technical producer, and currently is a leadership and production consultant. His career has taken him from casual games at Megatouch to AAA shooters at id Software and to Epic Games to work on a little game called Fortnite. Also co-author of three books, including Gear Up, Advanced Game Development Practices. Uh, Grant also enjoys building communities within the industry, working with the IGDA and the Game Dev Drink Up. And after Grant, we'll hear from Ian Main, who is technical marketing principal at our sponsor, Tara Dici, who will talk about remote work today and beyond the pandemic lockdowns. And with that, I'll pass it over to the incomparable Grant Schonkweiler. Wow, Chris, uh, thanks. That was, uh, <laughs> I don't even know how to live up to that <laughs> that introduction. And yes, uh, do not try and push a build to Steam one hour before uh, you're supposed to do a talk. It won't it won't complete, and I'm learning that painfully now, so uh, I'll have to deal with that after that. So thank you all for coming. Uh, the talk is entitled Intentional Leadership versus Accidental Leadership. We shortened it to just Intentional Leadership because it's easier, but I know we all like competitive things, so this is going to be a competitive talk. Uh, let me reintroduce myself. My name is Grant Schonkweiler, um, and I'm a production leadership consultant at Schonk Ventures because it turns out if you start your own company and you're a narcissist, you can name it after yourself, so I did that. Um, um, he talked a bit about, you know, my background as far as Epic Games at Software Megatouch. Um, I've shipped 65 plus games. Uh, I've been making games for 20 years and shockingly for 13 of that people have agreed to pay me. Um, so this is what we're going to do today. We're going to do the introduction, the focus. Uh, I'll explain that in a minute definitions, intentional leadership versus accidental leadership, and then workshop. Um, I recommend if you have some sort of writing utensil near or uh, to open up Notepad on your computer because we are going to do some note taking and some conversating through the Q&A tab. So I know that many of you have been doing this work from home thing for a while, and depending on where you are at, it could be any time of day. So I just want to take a few seconds for all of us to get focused. Uh, if you've been to my talks before, you know normally I have everyone stand up and scream, but that's probably not a good idea at your house. Who knows who would show up if you were just screaming? So we'll do things a little bit differently. Um, so if you're willing and able, please stand up. This will get kind of the blood flowing. Don't worry, you can sit down right after that. Um, now, I want you to think about all the stuff you're dealing with at work and in your personal life and bring it all right here to the center. Uh, now, we're going to breathe together, and each time we breathe out, push all of that out of your mind, and that way we can be present and focus on growing together through this session. I know it sounds weird, but I promise you this works. All right. Ready? Breathe in. And breathe out. One more. Breathe in. And breathe out. 
Awesome. Thank you for doing that with me. Go ahead and sit down or, or keep standing. Totally up to you. Uh, if anything, uh, you got that moment of Zen out of this and this amazing gift that I found on the internet. All right. So before we dive into the versus part, let's uh, define these two terms, intentional leadership and accidental leadership. So accidental leadership is usually what happens when um, someone just comes up to you and says, hey, you're a lead now, <laughs> right? Uh, or you come into a position and you say, Oh, I'm a lead. I'm going to I'm going to say I'm in charge of this stuff. So usually it's a ti a title, it's a uh, fake power, it's personal fear. You're kind of scared of what's happening. Uh, it's team fear. The team is probably scared that you don't know what you're doing. Um, it can be really lonely um, and it's very reactive. And we're going to call it goofus today, which I'll explain a little bit more in a second. Uh, intentional leadership on the other side is proactive. It focuses on your people and their growth. It strengthens and grows a servant leader. Uh, it's self-aware. We're going to call it gallant. And Judy Nelson in her book, Intentional Leadership, says intentional leadership is essential to creating a good environment for your team's success. When you are unintentional in your words and actions, you are likely to get unintentional consequences. So some of you uh, may remember the Goofus and Gallant comics. Uh, they were featured in a magazine called Highlights for many years. And the way that they worked was Goofus was kind of like the bad kid, and he did something that he shouldn't have done. And Gallant was the good kid showing the proper action. So I've, uh, I've borrowed those and changed the text on some of them. Some of them, uh, you'll see I did not change the text, um, to help guide us through this versus experience. Um, so again, Goofus is the... Uh, unintentional leader, the, and the intentional leader is gallant. So the first and easiest trait of an intentional leader is this one. Uh, it's proactive, not reactive. Goofus here is freaking out because of a new problem. Uh, gallant proactively fixed it before it was a problem, so he just gets to sit and read books. An example of this was when I was leading uh, the weapons design for a project. We were told we needed 10 weapons, but instead of designing 10 good weapons, we designed 15 good weapons. We, des we designed like 30, but like only 15 of them were good. And not surprisingly, the requirements changed and we needed more. But it was okay because we were ready. Uh, when talking about proactive instead of reactive, though, we aren't just talking about a situation like we see here, but also how you react to something new coming up. Imagine with me that you're in a leadership meeting and are explaining the next deadlines and goals. And your lead programmer speaks up and tells you there's no way you can hit that data date because the backing code won't be ready and they need more time. This is the first time he has brought this up, and this is what we call the intersection. You can react in a few different ways. You can freak out and berate him the goofus way. You can see him throwing papers, getting angry. Or you can sit for a second, take in the information, and say something like, this is new info. We'll have to take it into account. Let's chase that down after the meeting, and I'll get back to you all. And then move on to the next topic. Of course, don't use such stilted language. Uh, you know, you say your own words. Uh, simply, though, think before you speak. Intentional leaders don't say the first thing that comes into their mind. They know true wisdom is shown through a well-thought-out answer, not the first answer. Here we have the next one, communicate the mission and vision. Uh, Goofus is freaking out because Carl doesn't know the mission. Damn it, Carl! And uh, Gallant is making sure everyone on the team knows the mission by taking them on a picnic, I guess. <laughs> uh, communicate the mission clearly and often. Depending on where you are in leadership, you have to communicate either the mission or the vision of the game regularly. If you are in studio leadership, it is important to make sure everyone understands the mission of the studio. It's worth repeating at every company meeting and making sure people know. Remind the team why they work with you and give them that reason to be there. If you are leading a game team, it's important to make sure everyone knows the vision of the project. Uh, if you were able to watch the GDC talk I was part of in 2017, uh, Chuck and Oksana both had amazing tips for both of these. One of the awesome ones Chuck had was creating what they called a propaganda poster to sell the game vision and put so you to sell the game vision. So you make them and then you put them all over the team area. Um, you can also build a back of the game box. This is a, a cool traditional way of doing things to outline the main pillars and vision of the game. I've seen this work for my teams. Uh, I was working on a project that had been rebooted a few times. And because of that, the team was struggling to understand what the pillars and goals of the game were. So we spent a few days workshopping the pillars and the main statement of the game. And after we figured it out, we put signs up all around the studio with that info on it. Before each team meeting, we repeated the pillars and we repeated the goals. And in other meetings, we would reference them regularly saying, you know, does that fit within this goal or 
does that match this pillar? Uh, within a few weeks, I would hear people repeating the pillars in everyday conversation, which just made me feel like a proud papa. Um, the game went on to be critically acclaimed, and a lot of the reviews said things like, it had a singular vision and it stuck to it. They work with you, not for you. Goofus is demanding of his coworkers and treats them like servants. Pick those up. <laughs> Gallant knows working with the team is best for everyone. You might think this one is obvious, but it has to be in here because of what happens to our good friend Goofus when he is made a leader. A lot of people, when they are first made a leader, think that they now have some sort of a cosmic power <laughs> or that they are in control. And this really can't be further from the truth. It's now that you are a servant the most and you are serving your team. Yes, you may be setting the vision and the goals, but it's your responsibility to work with your team to get there. You should treat everyone with the same level of respect from the janitor to the VPs at the company. They're all looking at you to see how to act as well as how to be a team player. One thing I always tell new producers is congrats. You are now the lowest of the low. Everyone on the team is your boss from QA to the CEO. It's your job to make them all happy and enable them to be great. You can kind of think of it as like a inverted pyramid instead of, you know, you being at the top and pushing everything down. You're literally holding everybody up. Uh, when I was first made a lead, I was given a title, but no authority. Uh, I couldn't make decisions or tell the team what to do. This was a blessing and a curse uh, for multiple reasons. Luckily for me, I had several years of rapport built up with the team, so I was able to work with them to make changes. Oftentimes, I would find one person on the team to champion my ideas for me. All right, remember I said we we're going to have kind of interactive portions. So, um, you know, as I've been teaching throughout the years, I've learned that cognitive science tells us we need to reiterate things. And normally what I would do is I would have you stand up and talk to somebody next to you. Uh, but obviously that's a little harder unless you have someone next to you. Uh, so let's take a minute. I'll watch the time and write an action for each one of these on how you can be more proactive, how you can communicate better, and how you can be a, a better servant leader. Just write them down on a piece of paper or in notepad or wherever you can. I, uh, I, under, I underestimated how awkward it would be for me to just sit here for one minute and stare at the screen saying nothing. Hopefully that was uh, just as uncomfortable for you as it was for me. Uh, don't worry, we'll have uh, a couple more of those breaks in here for you to think about things. If you didn't uh, write anything down yet, at least copy down the questions so that you can think about them afterwards. All right, so the next one we have, give constructive and useful feedback. Goofus is frustrated that people on his team won't improve, so he's stealing apples. I'm not sure what how this one worked, but in my brain it worked. Gallant takes time to give feedback and rewards people with good work. Uh, I'm assuming and hoping that that is chocolate. Uh, this is a big one, and I could easily do a whole talk just on this topic, uh, but I won't because I only have 30 minutes. Giving good and constructive feedback may be the single best thing you can do for individuals on your team. Brene Brown observes that the lack of meaningful feedback is the number one reason cited by talented people for leaving an organization. And Winston Churchill said, criticism may not be agreeable, but it is necessary. It fulfills the same function as pain in the human body. It calls attention to an unhealthy state of things. With that in mind, though, make sure when you give someone feedback or criticism that you leave them knowing they can grow, not with a pain in their heart. A few ways to give good feedback are the following. First off, make sure... You talk with them about how to correct poor behavior. Don't just say you're doing a bad job. <laughs> be honest and direct. Don't sugarcoat it, just be honest and direct. Let them take time to think about it and then ask you questions. 
So give them a space to really think about the feedback and ask you questions. Sometimes that's within the, the feedback session. Sometimes that's, hey, come and talk to me in 15 to 30 minutes. Give the feedback in a form that shows you want to work with them to fix things. Now, I didn't add it to the slides, but don't do the whole poop sandwich thing where you say one good thing, then the hard feedback, then something good. It doesn't work well for most people. I know for me personally, I was told something this way once, and I left the one-on-one -on -one thinking I was crushing it, but I had missed the poo in the middle. Uh, it turns out, especially for, for millennials, uh, that all they hear is that they're, they're crushing it. So give them direct feedback, give them a space to think about it, and word it in a way that makes them realize you want to work with them. Now, somebody asked me a few days ago, how do I give feedback and sound genuine? How do I come across as not just like, hey, you're doing a great job, man. Uh, and the way to do that is to give feedback often. So it's as simple as showing appreciation, saying thank you, writing notes of gratitude. I know this one sounds kind of bizarre, but I did this one for a few months at one point, and I have the worst handwriting, and I was shocked at how well people reacted to this. I walked around the office at one point, and I saw dozens of people had posted my crappy handwritten notes to their desks and monitors, thanking them for their, their work. Uh, you could take people to lunch post-COVID. I don't recommend doing it right now, uh, and tell them, hey, great job. Now, as I said, this is a huge topic and there's a lot of stuff I could talk about here. Um, here are three resources you can go look at that, that will really start to help you in this space. Uh, thanks for the feedback is great for you to learn how to give and get feedback and difficult conversations, both of which are written by Douglas Stone and Sheila Heen, are uh, necessary reads for leads or managers. And one of my favorite GDC talks of all time is Brian Sharp's uh, GDC 2012 talk called Concrete Practices to Be a Better Leader, Framing an Intention. And it's on the GDC YouTube page, so just type in uh, Framing an Intention GDC and you'll find it. All right, next one, stretch your comfort zone. Uh, I don't like crust, says Goofus. Uh, Gallant says, this bread has nice crunchy crust. I told you sometimes I, I didn't edit these. This one was perfect in my mind. Uh, Chris Hogan sums this one up perfectly. Seven simple words can undermine your leadership. We've never done it that way before. So what? Great leaders chase new ideas. You won't make progress if you don't keep moving forward. Challenge yourself to take the next step, even if it's uncomfortable. As a leader, you're responsible for driving the team forward and not allowing stagnation. You can either keep following others or blaze your own path to success. Intentional leaders are willing to try new things and take risks, both for the company and personally. Uh, I like to think this is why I started skydiving because uh, it's a very calculated risk and it's very uncomfortable to look out of an airplane at 14,000 feet. Uh, but once you realize that you can uh, succeed at something like that, uh, all challenges are kind of easy. Uh, when I was working at Epic, I was, I was always impressed by Tim Sweeney. He constantly encouraged people in all meeting formats, be it three to five people to the entire company to challenge the way things were being done within the studio. And I think that's uh, kind of worked out for Epic pretty well. Own your mistakes. Uh, Goof is here, gets caught in a mistake and he flees. Uh, Gallant owns up to the mistake quickly by finding a payphone, I guess. <laughs> uh, being a leader is easier when things are going smoothly and everyone thinks you're doing a great job. But what about when you make a mistake? I mean, I, I know you may think you're not going to make a mistake, but I promise you at some point you will make a leadership mistake uh, that you will probably be embarrassed about for years. <laughs> well, the best thing to do is quickly own up to your mistake authentically apologize and explain what you have learned and how you will correct it. You will find that people will have more respect for you when you admit you made a mistake quickly. But what if there is an organizational mistake, one that you put someone in charge of, but you weren't responsible for? Well, you are still the leader and you put that person into that position, so you still need to own up to it. Regardless of who made the mistake, own it, develop next steps, and make sure everyone knows what to do. One of the most famous examples of this that I know of is from President Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs invasion. On April 21st, 1961, he took responsibility for the failure of the invasion, and he said, there's an old saying that victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. Further statements and detailed discussions are not to conceal responsibility because I'm the responsible officer of the government. 
And what's wild is after the speech, President Kennedy, Kennedy's approval rating soared to some of the highest it was during his entire presidency. Admitting a mistake builds trust. Be aware of your impact. Uh, Goofus and his playmate are noisy while mother is taking a nap. Mother is taking a nap. We must not, or we must play quietly. I just think Gallant realized he was going to get murdered by his mom if he was banging a drum while she's trying to take a nap. <laughs> As a leader of the team, everyone is looking at you for how to act and react to things. We've already talked about being proactive instead of reactive and how that shows your leadership to the team. But let's talk a bit about the impact you can have without knowing it. This is something I've always struggled with because I wear my heart right here on my sleeve. And a few years ago, I was I was really sick. And frankly, I was depressed because of that sickness. Every day was a struggle for me, and it showed. I tried being upbeat and positive at work, and I thought I was doing a good job. Then on a day that was especially hard, multiple people asked me if I was okay. And I gave my normal, what I thought was witty response of, well, I'm alive, <laughs> and thought nothing of it. My boss finally pulled me aside and said, are you okay? Are you mad? The team is worried. I explained what was going on and my boss understood, but what I hadn't put together was that my bad day had lined up perfectly with some hard to swallow news on the project and everyone thought I was walking around angry. Uh, and this gave them the right to also be angry. They weren't bringing me up to my boss and my attitude, but the changes. I had unintentionally set the mood for the entire team. And now that I was aware of my impact, I was able to correct it by going to the team and talking to them about my illness. I also started to focus on how I carried myself in the halls. And you know what? It, it helped my health improve as well. Now, I'm not saying that you have to wear a fake facade around your team, but being honest with them about things you might be struggling with that could be impacting your work is important. And uh, psychology says that if we start to think positively, it can it can affect our actual health. Uh, so that's that's a free tidbit. <laughs> Remember, your team members get their emotional and working cues off of you. If you are always frustrated, they will be as well. If you are confident, they will be confident. If you want people to focus on work life balance, then you need to focus on work life balance and set the example by leaving on time every day or signing off especially hard now in the time of COVID. All right, so here's gonna be another awkward one minute of me standing here staring at uh, my computer screen. Take some time and write one action that you can take feedback on for each of these. How to give better constructive feedback, how to stretch your comfort zone, and how to be more aware of your impact. All right, thank you so much for participating. I uh, like to imagine you're all furiously writing many ideas uh, down. All right, so this is gonna be our last of the versus slide, and then we're gonna get into uh, what I call the workshop portion of this talk. So focus on what matters most. Goofus is focused on all the little things and doesn't delegate, so he has to do his work while uh, you know, everybody else is chilling on the bus. Gallant focuses on what is important and delegates others work. And so he doesn't have to kill himself at work. Intentional leaders focus on where they can provide the most value and not on doing all the little things. We all know someone, we may be the someone that we have worked with that doesn't know how to delegate and how frustrating that is. Don't be that leader. But why do people act like this? Uh, trust is the single big biggest reason Simply, they don't trust, trust their team. You may not trust your team 
or you may not trust yourself. <laughs> there are a lot of issues there, first of which maybe you aren't working with the right people. Uh, but secondly, you need to build the trust relationship. Uh, this is something I love being part of and helping companies do. If you want to talk to me about it at some point, I'd love to chat with you about how to build trust relationships, but I didn't have enough space in the talk to go through it all. So start by delegating the small things first. Uh, let people be successful in that, and that will start to build trust. So the problem is, though, how do you figure out what to delegate? Where do you provide the most value to your team? And when should you delegate it? So this is, this is the really interactive portion. So who here, <laughs> normally I would ask this question and ask people to raise their hands, but have you heard of the 80-20 principle before? Uh, the idea that 80% of problems can be attributed to 20% of the causes. Here are some of the 80-20 examples. The most important one, I think, being the bottom one. 80% of problems can be attributed to 20% of causes. 80% of a company's profits come from 20% of its customers. Microsoft noted that by fixing the top 20% of the most reported bugs, 80% of the related errors and crashes in a given system would be eliminated. That sounds amazing, by the way. <laughs> and the big one, 80% of a company's profit comes from 20% of the time its staff spent. Uh, hopefully some of you have read these books, The 80-20 Manager and The 80-20 Principle by Richard Koch. These are seminal books, and in them, uh, Richard talks about all the different ways that the 80-20 principle manifests itself. Quite simply, 20% of the work you do provides 80% of the value to your team. So focus on that 20%. So we're gonna do an exercise together to help us each find out what that is. All right, so again, be ready to write things down, and I'm going to ask you at some point to use the Q&A tab to send me your answers to some of these. Uh, just put a number in front of it and send me the answer, and then we'll kind of work through them and talk about them. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to write down what you do that you feel provides the most value to the team, your team specifically, obviously. <laughs> All right, next one. What is the most valuable thing that you do for your team? Or the, sorry, what is the second most valuable thing that you do for your team? All right, next one. What is the thing you do that takes the most time? Next, what do you do that provides the least value to your team. Now this one may be a hard one for you to figure out uh, and you may need to ask other people on the team eventually what they feel uh, that is, but try and think of something. And the last one here, what do you do that provides little value and takes a lot of time? Let me give you an example of this one that I found out when I did this exercise for the first time. Uh, email. <laughs> Turns out I was spending hours of my day sending emails and the team found no value out of it. And I didn't realize that until I started to talk to them about this and, and start to figure this out. So what I did was I locked myself to only checking email every two hours. I let my team know if it was urgent, they should come and find me, and then went from there. And I thought it was a, a vast improvement to both my productivity and my uh, 
sanity. <laughs> All right, so go ahead and use the Q&A tab and put what you had for number one uh, through five in there. Just use a number and put them in there, and I'm going to read some of them out and talk a little bit about them. Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties here. I'm unable to uh, see the, the Q&A tab. It shows that there are 10 new things, but I cannot read them. So I'm going to have somebody else send them to me in a different chat format. And we'll look at them that way. Um. Okay. I, I can help read some, read some out to you yeah. if, if you want. Would that help? Yeah, that would help. Sorry, for some reason when I click on it, it the whole pay, the whole tab just disappears. <laughs> no, that, that's all right. Um, how about this one answering uh, question one? Do you want one of those? Yeah. Let's okay. Um, so uh, being present and available. What Ooh. do you feel that provides the most value to the team? Being present and available. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a huge one. Definitely just being around and able to to talk to people is is super mm -hmm. valuable. Um, mm -hmm. Since that took a little bit of time there, Chris, can you read me um, a couple that give answers to number three? Yeah, of course. Um, production data and information transparency is one. And right. Someone else for number three listed one-on-ones. <laughs> yeah, I think that one's pretty important. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that one's a big one. Normally, normally, what I what I want people to do is really dive into the things that take the most time. Are they that twenty percent value? And sometimes you have to really dig and wrestle with that, uh, and and try and figure out if they are providing that value. So, uh, I'm finally able to see some of the questions now. Uh, I refreshed the browser. So let me look through here real quick. Uh, meeting notes. Yeah, those are a big one. Production data and information transparency. Uh, yeah, that's a big one. And I think that there's value there, but it sounds to me like you can probably automate some of that and then it's not uh, your entire time. One-on-one um, -on -one training, that takes a lot of time. So, okay. Great. So these are awesome. Thank you so much for, for all those. I'm sorry that there was a bit of a snafu there. But what I really want you to do is I want you to think about number three and does that provide value to the team? Ask people on your team if it provides value to them. Uh, and then I want you to take number four and see if number four and five are also something that take a lot of time. So if you go through this process, there's a last step you have to do before uh, starting to eliminate things. So what do you do when you get back to work, right? So first off, tell your boss. <laughs> tell your boss that you're going to do this radical thing where you're going to eliminate some of your work. Uh, let them keep you accountable. Ask them uh, to have weekly one-on-ones that specifically are making sure that you're not dropping the ball on something. And let them know if you are dropping anything important. Then. Ask people on your team, I did this in like an interview format, what you do that is most valuable to them. And then the bigger question, how do you hinder their work? How do you make their work harder? That's a hard question for, for a producer to ask, especially because uh, you might not like what you hear. Then once you have the list figured out, drop and delegate the three lowest of them. And you may be wondering, what's the best way to do this? I made some crappy art here from uh, from paint, and this is the best way to do things. So you take all the things on your list and you plot them on here. What is high value and low time, right? What is high value and high time? And your goal is to look at all the things that are Cs, and especially Cs in the right quadrant, and eliminate them. You just want to get rid of them, right? Because they're low value to the team and they're taking a lot of your time. 
definitely a great process. I would love to hear how it works out for people. If you uh, want to reach out to me and talk a little bit more about it, or just tell me how the process goes for you, uh, here's my email. Uh, I want to end with this quote, and then we're uh, going to go on to Ian's talk. Leadership doesn't just happen with a snap of your fingers. It happens every day when you take intentional steps that push you and your team to the next level. Know where you want to take your business, keep going in that direction no matter what, and take your team along with you. That's intentional leadership. And once Ian's done talking, we'll have some time for Q&A, so you can continue to use that tab to, to ask questions, uh, and we'll get to those uh, once Ian is done. All right. Thanks, Grant. Uh, you will always be my gallant in the video game industry. <laughs> and uh, fantastic talk. Uh, as a reminder to our attendees, um, you can ask speaker, the speakers questions at any time during the presentation. So uh, feel free to do that. Type them into the Q&A area. Please don't be shy. Um, if we do run out of time here, uh, you'll be able to follow up with our speakers um, offline. Um, so up next, we have our sponsor friend, Ian Main. He is technical principal from Tara Dichi to talk about remote work and the solutions that his company can offer. But uh, stick around and you can ask Grant and Ian your questions afterwards. So take it away, Ian. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Hey, and thanks, Grant. I'm sitting here scribbling notes all over. And yeah, uh, challenge yourself to take risks and uh, look at that status quo. I like those ones, but I got lots of others. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I'm Ian Main, Technical Marketing Principal at Tara Dichi. And I'm just going to spend 10 minutes or so talking about um, how we fit into the game development uh, industry. Um, so Teradici has been around quite a long time, and we're the company that created the PCOVIP remote, remote display protocol. Um, it's used in many industries, um, healthcare, government, finance, um, big and medium entertainment, and increasingly so in game development, which we're going to talk about here. And um, in 2019, we went through a major upgrade to our remote display protocol called PCOVIP Ultra, and that's really been beneficial to this work-from-home environment that we're all operating in, so we'll talk about that just a little bit. And, of course, for our product to be successful, we partner with uh, a lot of industry giants, uh, Amazon, Azure, uh, GC Google, and then NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel on the hardware side, as well as the server manufacturers, so that we can bring an end-to-end -end, uh, solution for our, our customers that we're going to talk about here. So our product is called Cloud Access Software. And what that is is a remote display uh, solution, including all the client technology and the host technology. So if you look at this graphic here, we have an artist or perhaps a developer, CI, CD pipeline person, a video editor, all sorts, anything, visual effects, animator, um, and they're working at a multi-display system with all their familiar keyboard mouse. They could be using tablet devices. And instead of having a PC under their desk, as you might have traditionally in office, they're working across a network to a remote computer. And what happens is our PC of IP protocol compresses and encrypts the pixels in the host data center and sends them across a network. And then they reproduce here at the client side and the user experience is as if you're working on a local machine. So you don't have any compromise in frame rate and image quality, which is a, a bit what we'll talk about here. So uh, that's what Cloud Access Software is. And um, it's really used prolifically in media and entertainment. Most uh, large studios that do remote uh, access to their computers are using Teradici's Cloud Access Software and our PCI-IP protocol. So, just a small sampling of names here, but we, we work with very large studios and increasingly in game development from uh, the education side. We work with film schools that have education uh, game development programs, uh, several medium-sized studios. We have a, a case study I'll just point out at the end. And then we also work with some of the major studios doing AAA production. So we have customers across the board. And in uh, visual effects and increasingly in game development, you know, there's a lot of IP and uh, investment dollars into these products. So security is a key driver for, for this protocol. Um, and in the movie business, you need to meet all these compliance regulations to make sure that the content is secured. And, and so if you use our, our remote display protocol, then you achieve that compliance. Now, these days, there's lots of uh, companies providing remote display technology. So I just wanted to point out why Teradici is so prolific, especially in these 
high graphic and high visualization markets. Um, it's all about user experience. So you want a low latency interaction with your computing device. You can't be waiting for uh, your display to update. And your image quality has to be exactly as if it was local. You can't have any color inaccuracies or artifacts on your display because then you don't know if that's in your actual source content or whether the protocol is introducing errors. So that's critical. Um, we're very flexible. We work for Windows hosts, uh, Linux hosts, which is important in some of these industries, including game development. Um, and uh, we've now announced later this year we'll be actually be supporting Mac OS on the host side too. Um, and then on the client side, the device you're accessing your computer from, that could be Windows, Linux. We have zero clients, thin clients, mobile clients uh, across the board. So you're, you're very flexible in how you access that. And then I've made a passing mention to security. Um, that's all about encrypted pixels so that uh, this connection between the data center and the endpoint uh, is completely secure. Now, this is just a, an info of what, a graphic of what happened back in March 2020. You know, people were working, um, that's a full year ago, gosh. Um, people were working at their, often under at a desktop uh, PC under their desks. Um, it could be a workstation class or just a consumer graphics card. If you're doing game work, you're often using various uh, types of uh, devices uh, or work boxes under your machine, under your desk there. Um, in, in the movie industry, people were, are increasingly using virtualized workstations anyhow. And so for them, when they were sent home, it was actually a fairly quick switch to just redirect um, the connection from on-premises to, to that home use case. So, so what we have now is instead of uh, anybody working in the office, we're all at home. And um, we have this connection out to the endpoint where it's circled there saying uh, across a public internet connection. That's how I'm speaking right now. And instead of... Um, needing a VPN or you know, virtual private network, um, we're sending these encrypted pixels, which means no VPN is required. There's no content itself inside of the home environment. So you're not pulling assets over VPNs. If you've had to do that, you'll know that takes lots of time. You're waiting for assets. And of course, your IT uh, have a problem because assets at the endpoint is always a security problem. So the data is always secured inside um, the data center or the content network, however it's configured, and the users are just accessing their uh, remote workstations with pixels. It's all stateless uh, and secure. And for the IT people here, um, we have multi-factor authentication, so there's you know secure login to those environments um, over the over the connection. And top right, you'll see a, a cloud there called Teradici. That's our connection management uh, environment. So we to manage the user entitlement between the users and which workstation they've been chosen to use, um, and uh, and also powering on and off workstations if that's in the cloud. So that's our cloud access manager. Recently, until recently, that was a a, a cloud service that Teradici provides, which is still the case. But we've also added the ability to have that cloud access manager being run on your on site on your facility for those studios that have want to be completely dark site and don't want any. Uh, connections to the public cloud. So we offer those two options. Now, we have many partnerships I mentioned at the beginning to get this to all work prop properly. One I point out that's really interesting and important uh, for uh, people doing asset creation in particular, you're using very many artists are using Wacom tablets. That's almost the industry standard these days. And the problem is that if you separate a user and their uh, environment from that remote data center, whether it's a public cloud or whether it's just your corporate facility, the bigger the latency of that distance between the two. Um, so a, that latency manifests itself when, you look, when you're looking at your display as a big lag in the position of your pen on the tablet. And that be it becomes unusable once you're over 15 to 20 milliseconds, um, especially if you want to be productive. And you that artistic capability is taken away. So Teradici many years ago um, started adding a, um, some magic on the client side. So whether that endpoint is a zero client or your PC um, or your Mac, we have a, a feature called local termination. What we do is we, te we terminate those tablet drivers and we reflect the uh, position information directly uh, as you're drawing. And what happens is in the background, the tilt and pressure information goes back to the, the applications, whether they ZBrush or Autodesk or whatever applications Blender you're using with your tablet. Um, and interactively, you're working with that tablet as if it was uh, connected to a device right under your machine. So that's a game changer and really needed for when you're working from uh, over remote connections. 
Now, what I thought I'd do just for, uh, before I sort of finish up, uh, I, I'm curious, and I think you may be curious too, as to how um, everybody is planning to go back into the uh, their office just before I finish off the way we see, uh, see the future panning out. I would like to get some input as to from the, uh, the participants to hear. In 2022, do you see yourselves at home most of the time, um, maybe half the time, or mostly back at the office, but occasionally at home, or will your team be mandated to just all go back to the office and back to the life as it was back in 2019? So I'll give you all a few seconds to, to answer that, and then I'll show the, the poll results, um, and uh, and really interested to see what everybody's seeing. So let me give you 10 or 15 seconds to look at that as to whether you're looking forward to 9 to 5 rush hour again, or is it uh, coffee in your pajamas? That's the question. All right, we've got a we've got a good number of responses here, so I'm going to move along and let's see uh, what, what the the queue is. All right, so wow, this is really quite interesting. So we're looking at maybe 70 to 80 percent of people will be working at home. A big degree, you know, some degree at a time, and very few people are going to going back to the office full time. So that's really interesting. And the reason why this is a fitting point for the poll question is I've just got a slide here that shows the way uh, we see it and the way it's actually already manifesting itself, which is a, a hybrid multi cloud environment. So this slide takes a couple of minutes just to walk through, but what we have is a on premises environment. Um, so this is your game studio connected to. Uh, a public cloud. I mentioned earlier that we partner with all the public cloud vendors. Um, so I th what we see is that the, the way people will work at uh, the office will be different. You'll be going in for collaboration. You'll be going in for review meetings, uh, but less for your actual production development. So we have on the bottom left there people working at the office, potentially doing development, but mostly actually doing a new type of work, which is more collaborative. And then what we see, and Gartner supports us in their statistics, is that many more users will be that bottom right user working from home, accessing their corporate infrastructure. Um, but what we're seeing really rapidly transitioning is studios, and whether this is game development studios or visual effects studios, any post-production uh, uh, as well, are augmenting their on-premises resources with public clouds. And this gives them a broader footprint, so now, they can uh, hire artists that are far away from the corporate office, which is awesome for the company. And of course, it's also awesome for artists because you can now go seek out uh, opportunities that are further away from your local city where you're living. Um, so we get this combination and you'll notice all your favorite applications that you're used to using are deployed on these virtual workstations or physical workstations, um, either in the public cloud or on premises. There's no... Um, VPNs, connections, and this Cloud Access Manager, the top right cloud still exists. So that Cloud Access Manager is a single management environment, which now uh, manages this whole multi-cloud environment with just a single uh, connection or a, between users and the actual uh, devices they're entitled to. I mean, some of the benefits here are, uh, you know, if you're on a project doing a game PC, but you need more resources for rendering, for example, or asset creation, you can fire up a really high performance public cloud machine for a short term, just pay as you go for that and then get back to your old machine if you're favorite. So uh, a key point is there is that especially for game development is developers are still using their favorite machines except that they're connected in remotely uh, under their desk rather than being uh, uh, tied directly through the local cables. And to uh, a case in point is a, a one of our customers, FireSprite, out of uh, Liverpool, United Kingdom, and I think they've grown really fast with uh, over the last year to two years with uh, the interest in uh, new content, uh, famous for game uh, titles like The Persistence. I think they um, have grown to about 130 people now, and they, what they do is they add uh, boxes back in the office, and then people just uh, dial in remotely. And then, like my previous slide, once uh, 2022 rolls around, hopefully they get back to choose between whether they want to access those machines uh, locally or remotely um, as, as the policies allow or as they, their workflow allows. So that's a quick uh, summary of um, 
Terry Ditchie, we've got lots of details, customer stories, uh, architecture guides, and so on on our website. So I encourage you to go check those out. And I think the next step is we're going to throw it open for uh, Q&A. So I'll pass it back to you, Chris. You are correct. We're going to go to, go to uh, Q&A now. Um, and uh, just before we, uh, we go to that, um, as a reminder uh, to participate in the Q&A, type the question into the Q&A uh, text box. Um, and if we're not able to answer all of your submitted questions during today's webcast, uh, we'll make sure uh, we'll be sure to share them with our speakers who can reply to you later on offline. Um, so with that, let's start the, uh, the Q&A. Um, first one we have here um, looks like it is in response to Grant's presentation. Uh, but Ian, if you have any thoughts, you can jump in as well. Uh, what if your team? What if your team doesn't recognize uh, value? That is, more rigor in production is seen as low value, but the team crunches and runs late. Mm. Yeah. So, I, I guess what the question is asking is, what if the team doesn't see value in you as a producer? <laughs> I think that um, you know, step one, you gotta kind of have to evaluate what you're doing and and. If it's successful, it sounds like if your team is crunching and is late, then it's not successful. So I would take a step back and evaluate the whole process. So I would talk to the team about their thoughts on production, start to understand um, what's going on there, and and just have them talk also about all the leaders on their team and their thoughts on that. And this can be kind of a frustrating experience because they might be venting or upset or angry, um, but you spend some time really understanding what's going on. And I would then start to refocus uh, on what matters to them and try and get them into a state where they aren't having to crunch or work hard. And that's when you'll start showing what your value is and they'll understand what your value is uh, through that. Going right to the next one, looks like a uh, question for Ian. What sort of network do I need for remote game development? Yeah, that's a that's a very common question. Of course, our protocol works from on any network, and these days, increasingly, a Wi-Fi network for that last hop inside your home. Um, but for vis high high visual content, we're typically saying sort of at least 10 megabits, um, depending on your display resolution and other things. We have guidelines that in more detail. Um, but if you're doing text work, like you're doing like pipeline development, you actually can get away with just a couple of megabits per second, although most people have more than that these days. All right, one for Grant. Um, and again, uh, either of you can jump in with, with any thoughts on any of these, but uh, Grant, do you have tips for difficult people in your team, um, especially for people who make their own choices sometimes against what you decided? This isn't because they want to plot against the project, but because they are kind of independent and very motivated and passionate about the project. Yeah, that's a great that's a great challenge. So the first thing that I would do is I would I would sit with them and make sure that they understand the goals and the vision and the pillars and make sure that they're directing in that direction. Um, sometimes you're going to have to have hard conversations with them and, and, and cut something that they did to remind them that that you're working as a team, right? It's not one person going off and making something super cool, but it's a group of people, be it two people to 200 people that are building this game together. And so when decisions are made, those decisions have to be respected because they may not understand why their change is going to impact things negatively, right? So say they think, oh, I'm going to add a double jump to the game, and they go off and they add double jump to the game on their own. Well, now all the levels have to be rebuilt, <laughs> right? Because now double jump is a thing, and so you have to account for that throughout. So making sure that they understand why going off track is, is a problem. Now, there's also ways to set them up to be successful within that space of them wanting to feel independent and move through things. So giving them prototypes or things that they can kind of go off on their own to discover what is fun uh, is an option as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, going to be some hard conversations because you need someone to be performing as a, as a team player. Uh, looks like a quick one for Ian. Which cloud should I use? Uh, oh, yeah. So I think I mentioned we all, we support uh, Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud, and we have marketplace images for all of those. So it's pretty easy to 
you know, fire up uh, an instance on them. But then, so it becomes a question of being within your region, so you get that lowest latency interaction, and then perhaps the types of instances that are preferential based on what your workflow looks like. And then, of course, the clouds are building game development tools. Um, you know, AWS is Lumberyard, and they have some of the CI/CD tools. So that may be say sway it as well. Look at the actual tools they're providing for the workflow. Um, uh, and then uh, choose something that supports your users based on their regionality. Great. Uh, keep on going here. Uh, got a question. I found it difficult to be proactive in certain situations as a woman among leadership because it gets dismissed for one reason or another. Uh, what would you suggest as far as techniques to try? Yeah. Uh, first off, I'm sorry that that is happening. That's very frustrating and 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 shouldn't shouldn't be happening. Uh, and secondly, uh, you know, obviously, I'm not a woman, so I'm I'm not going to be speaking from from that experience. Um, I think what what I would suggest is uh, there's a couple ways to to sneak around this. And if you feel like you're constantly being dismissed. Uh, and I've been in this situation as, as a man, um, just because of where I sat in leadership, I was constantly being dismissed. So what I did was I would find a champion to work with, right? So say there's a leadership team of six people, really all you got to do is win one of those people over to what you need to decide and then have them help you champion that idea through leadership. Um, it, it can be frustrating. I found that I've, uh, lost, uh, I don't know how to say this. That person has got praise over me because they were championing my idea, but it has helped uh, be better for the project. So that's one way to do things, but don't don't like erase yourself, right? The two of you go together to make these statements. Um, as far as the proactiveness of it, I think that one thing that I've found is hard for anybody in leadership is continuing to be proactive when not getting positive feedback. And so if that is a constant thing that is happening to you, then it might be time to look to go somewhere else. I know that I've struggled with that at a job before where I was not getting any positive feedback or even growth feedback for a long time. And so I was able to shift within that company uh, to work under a different boss. So if you're constantly being put down or, or dismissed by the people above you, uh, that might be uh, you know, that's like the nuclear option, so to speak, is to just find a way out of it. But yeah, it's definitely a, a difficult uh, way to deal with things. Feel free to reach out to me and we can talk more and maybe I can connect you to some uh, women that have a little bit more relevant experience. And uh, I've got to shoehorn one last question before we wrap up. And I think both of you can comment on it. Um, how do you, uh, like, a as a leader, uh, how, how do you become an effective uh, remote leader? Hmm. Uh, I'll, I'll start with that one, Ian, and then you can close this out. So um, it's harder to have what are called crash experiences, right, where you are just uh, walking through the halls and you can talk to somebody or go on a walk with somebody or go get lunch, right? Those experiences don't happen as much. So what you have to do is be more intentional about your questions in conversations. Um, and so what I mean by that is uh, you really want to dig in when people are talking. And sometimes that's as simple as asking them how their day is going and digging in on that. Sometimes it's digging in when they're talking about a problem uh, that they're trying to solve at work, right? So you, that's one way to start to get to know them better. But you have to continue to do some of the things that we talked about, like praise people, praise them in public, you know, take them aside and have conversations, do one-on-ones. All those things are, are just as important um, remotely as they are in person. Yeah, I think uh, the team environment is one has to, you know, spend a lot more effort maintaining a team sensibility to to what we're doing and uh, of course we're all spending a lot more time on chat as a way of of uh, providing you know instructions and goals and if you're finding uh, that uh, an emotion associated with chat then often your uh, ideas or concepts or even your direction is being misconstrued and so you know i encourage you to get on to short calls uh, you know short calls as well because we're all busy uh, because as soon as you're doing this in person, even if it's virtually, it's a lot more uh, efficient and you don't misunderstand each other uh, compared to using emails and chats where things uh, get misinterpreted. 
And that's all the time that we have. Uh, Thanks again, Ian and Grant. You're both fantastic. Absolute whirlwind of useful information there. Uh, But that's all the time we have today. Um, Thanks again to Tara Dicci for making this possible. And also thanks to our audience and for participating. Um, We are going to make this available so you can share it. I saw someone wanted to share it in a game production discord. Um, That would be fantastic. Everyone else can do that. Also, you'll be getting a link in the, in your email. Um, And we're going to talk about, we're going to re-promote this on gamasutra.com, which is open 24 seven. So um, within the next day, you'll be receiving a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. And uh, this uh, webcast is copyright by Informa, my bosses. The individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. And that's it for this one. Thanks for your time and have a great day.